Hello, we're continuing with our series from the book of Philippians, Joy, Unity, Growth. And as we left chapter one, we found Paul saying some surprising things perhaps from his prison cell as he writes to these believers hundreds of miles away. In chapter one and verse 29, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been granted, Paul says, yes, to believe in him, to believe in Christ, but also to suffer and to suffer on his behalf. And that gives Paul great joy, even though there is real agony and real struggle as he suffers for the sake of Christ. That word that he uses in verse 30, now having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. That word is used of athletics when an athlete is laying it all down on the track as we might say the, the sweat pouring out absolute anguish all that training and preparation coming to that moment of competition there's an agony there's a struggle and that's what Paul is experiencing and he's saying you're sharing in that with me what a privilege what a precursor to exaltation as we will see next time when we get to Christ's example, chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, speaking of all the selflessness of Christ, but verse 9, therefore God has also highly exalted him. That seems to be the pattern, doesn't it? Exaltation follows after that humiliation and suffering. So that's to be clear in our minds, a clear mindset for Paul and for the believers that suffering is going to be a reality. Uh, and it will have unforeseen results. Uh, chapter 1, verse 28, we saw last time. It will be a confirmation to you of your own salvation, that you're enduring suffering, but also a proof to those who are fighting against you, who are causing the suffering, that they are lost. And there's great comfort in Christ as we see how he is working out his great plans, the joy that is ours in him, even as the chains bite in Paul's case, or more likely in our own circumstances, as those words that are spoken against us sting, as our reputation plummets because we stand fast for Christ. There's great comfort to be had in the midst of that. And that's what Paul is writing from his prison cell, assuring him, yes, there is comfort in Christ as we read from chapter as we'll read from chapter 2 and verse 1 there is consolation comfort in Christ comfort in the love of Christ selfless gospel loved received from God and shown to one another and having received such comfort we in turn are to be those who bring comfort and so our title for today is looking to comfort if you tuned into our Job series uh, this morning, we found Job looking for comfort. And by one of those curious coincidences, as we might see, an overruling providence of God, this evening we look at looking to comfort. Our role is to bring comfort to others, as the Apostle Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, as he explains uh, his experiences. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. We're comforted by God, and in turn, we are to bring God's comfort to others, we are to be the means by which God would help them. So we're going to read now our passage for today, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4. And Karen's going to read that for us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of hope, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. 
let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so there's an abundant joy coming through here from Paul as he writes. Uh, the joy in a submitted life in Christ, in the context of the unity of mind, unity of action, that's going to lead to growth. That's his great desire. Remember his prayer that he set out at the beginning of his letter and uh, summarised in chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of christ coming together in unity and growing together in love and knowledge and it seems so obvious perhaps to us that to follow in the way of christ who gave himself for us should involve us giving ourselves for the benefit of others it, it, it seems so obvious and yet we're swimming against the the current aren't we against the current of our culture that is so taken up with the need of the individual with the rights of the individual i must have uh, what i want to do and nobody can tell me otherwise but we're also swimming against the tide of our own instinct that survival instinct that would so readily put our own interests our own needs at the front of the queue, we're fighting against the army, aren't we? So Paul brings a mixture of exhortation here in chapter 2, mixed with that prayer background that he's already introduced his letter with, and example. Chapter 2 is full of examples. In a sense, he's overshadowed by the ultimate example of Jesus Christ, the selfless comforter. But for this week, we're just going to sketch out some of the elements of what it means to be one who comforts. And that sketch will be filled in, coloured in, made gloriously uh, apparent as we think about Christ next time. We don't exactly know what was going on in Philippi, but there seems to have been disunity, infighting, perhaps stoked by false teachers who were encouraging factions and, and distinctions between the brothers and sisters and Paul has already urged them to stand fast together to be bonded together in love as they stand for the truth and as they work out the power of the gospel that has changed their lives that has brought them together in the first place and so at the beginning of chapter two he reminds them of the gospel truth the power that is theirs when he says if he's not casting doubt on the, the truth of them receiving Christ as Saviour and Lord. He, he's simply pointing out this is, this is the situation. This is the reality. There is comfort in Christ. Uh, there is love. There is fellowship of the Spirit, partnership together, that word, of the one who comes alongside to comfort us and to equip us to be comforters. The parakletos, he uses that same word that Jesus used in describing the helper, the comforter, the spirit. God equips us for this work. He trusts us with this work. And that needs to shape our minds as we think about others. Too often we would be wary of others, wondering what they're up to, what, what their agenda is. But we need to heed the exhortations that Paul has here that we have received mercy, we must show mercy. We've been saved from the wrath to come, saved from sin. That's an important emphasis. But we've also been saved to good works. We've been saved to be bonded together in unity in Christ with brothers and sisters, serving together, striving together, standing fast together being the witness to Christ and his glory and the power of the gospel to bring warring factions together, to make enemies become friends and partners in the gospel. And so he goes on to be very clear, having set that gospel context and saying how fervently he wants them to think differently. Verse two, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Well, what does that look like? It begins with some negatives. 
all those weeks ago, maybe you remember the Prime Minister sitting in Downing Street, I think, wasn't it, as he um, issued various instructions to us of how we were going to be restricted in our normal routine. Do not do this. Do not do that. Do not. And he clenched fists. And it was a very sobering message because he wanted people to be very clear about the threat that was facing the country in this time of virus. This is real. Don't do these things. Paul is saying, nothing through selfish ambition. Those other words have been supplied. So it's a very strong statement, perhaps not with clenched fists, but nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, vain glory, doing things to make yourself look good. And maybe as you hear a verse like that read, it's not easy to reflect on how your behaviour, how your thinking has been like that. We don't, we don't think of examples of, of, of how we've been selfishly ambitious or vainglorious. But what about those times you've shaded the truth to get what you want? You've manipulated another person, either by giving them the silent treatment or by a bit of sharp-edged humour? What about that competitive spirit, that agonising over something that's only temporary? Be that a physical thing or respect from other people, you've put everything into it, but for yourself, is that not selfish ambition? Vainglory? If you've got broadband that's bringing you this message into your home, and as I understand it, you have to opt in to the unsavoury things that you can find on the internet. Previously, they were all uh, available and you had to set some controls, but now that's automatic. There's an automatic filter on your broadband to aid uh, the safe surfing for families and avoid nasty things popping up on your screen, hopefully. And that idea of filtering what comes in is in our minds, isn't it? Are we actively filtering what comes into our minds so that the things that we say and the things that we do will be good and right and selfless. God has given us the filter we need, his truth. Do we filter what we think, what comes into our minds through the truth? What, what does God say about this? Are the thoughts that I'm having about that situation, about the other person, thoughts that I would be ashamed of before Jesus, who, who knows the mind? And when we become more saturated with God's truth, we will find that the emphasis that we put on our own needs will diminish. As we're filled with God's goodness and, and God's grace. It's so obvious, isn't it, when we read missionary prayer letters, perhaps. There's many things that they could tell us about the hardships that they face and the difficulties. And yes, they mention those sometimes for prayer, but so often in the context of, of humility and of the bigger part that they can see in God's plan. We need to teach ourselves a better way, don't we, to be more readily filtering what comes into our minds so that we don't fall into the habit that so easily comes of pursuing selfish ambitions. Christ is the ultimate example of selflessness and as I've said already his example casts a shadow over the whole of this chapter but I want to leave that for next time. His selflessness must be our example of selflessness. Boris Gave some very emphatic negative messages, but that then changed slightly to be more positive, wasn't it? Positive messages, because they know that people listen better to positive instructions than to don't do this, don't do that. And so we had the stay home, uh, protect the NHS, save lives, positive things that people want to do to get better compliance. And Paul, likewise, having said, don't do anything from selfish ambition, then goes on to speak of the positive acts positive instructions, the humility of mind that is to be ours. Two, verse three, esteem others better than ourselves, having a lowliness of mind. And when we're talking about esteeming others better than themselves, it's not a charter for some sort of 
self-deprecation, always putting yourself down, having some sort of inferiority complex. That's, that's not the idea, just being down yourself. It's, it's about thinking about other people's needs. And the word esteem there is actually a maths word in the original Greek. You need to treat other people's needs as a plus. That's needs, not necessarily what they want, but what they need. And view your own agenda, your own interests, your own needs as a negative. So let's do some maths. If you imagine uh, another person's needs, number one, but then you've got your needs that may be different from that. So you can have one minus one equals zero. You end up with, with nothing. And the amazing thing in maths, of course, is that if you take away a negative, it becomes a positive. Ask any mathematician. One minus minus one doesn't equal naught. It equals two. So we need to find a way of making our own needs into a negative. You remember, if you've got somebody's needs are, are one and we've got our needs that are also counterbalancing that, we'll end up with nothing. But if we make our needs as a negative and we, we view of taking them away for the benefit of this other person, they will be benefited. They won't just have their need, they'll be super abundant and have twice their need. So it works in maths. It's one of those things that you think doesn't seem to make sense when you're first learning about taking away negatives and all the rest of it in maths. But it's got something to instruct us here in terms of bringing comfort to others. The way that we can do that is by making our own needs a negative and making sure that those are put out of the way and turning it then the focus onto another person's needs, maximize their interests. And so Paul says we need to look out for the interests of others. There's a vigilance required. And this is in the context of a, a church situation, true, caring family relationships within the church are to be our primary concern. And that's a real challenge at the moment, isn't it? Particularly with the restrictions that are in place because of COVID. There's a great opportunity presented for us to grow and settle into self-serving habits because we can't go about our normal routine. We can't have the normal contact with others. We can't meet together in the same way as a church. And we need to tell ourselves, remind ourselves, do the maths that tells us when we're just going to be habitually serving ourselves, it's going to leave us empty and everybody else empty. We need to seize the words that Paul is writing. Uh, see, this, this is an opportunity to be a comforter, to look to comfort others in the local situation, but also internationally with all the blessings we have of modern means of communication. Are we slow to seek the good of others, to heed what they're saying, to remember other people's interests, slow to put ourselves out in the time and care that others would need? It means we're not calculating, we're not esteeming. It needs to be a deliberate act, doesn't it? A positive, something we can do to make a difference. We need to believe God's word, don't we? We say we do, but when Paul says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, he means nothing. Nothing motivated by selfish ambition. That's a, that's a big ask, isn't it? But are we taking it seriously? Do we think, well, it's just the big things? No, it's in everything, every thought. Do we really believe Paul's words? Believe that they are the way to fulfilling our joy, the right way to live, the way to be truly united, the way for us to grow together is to think in this way. So he sets the scene by rehearsing those givens of the gospel that bring us comfort. And he goes on to show us the ultimate example of service in the Lord Jesus Christ, which brought us comfort so that we can grasp that our comfort is yes, for our good, but also for the good of others, so that we may glorify Christ. I wonder if there's some changes that we need to make in our outlook 
we've settled into a pattern of uh, life under covid of how we do church and it's easy just to be passive isn't it just for things to sort of pass us by our interactions on hangouts as a church or as we watch the sermons it's the same as if we were watching a tv program it makes no difference to us we're just passive let's pray that the word will come into our lives with power and highlight those areas where we are falling short of the the good that God would have for us, change us, enable us uh, to follow in the footsteps of Christ, though it's at such cost to ourselves, that we may grow, that we may be united, and that together we may find true joy as we look to comfort one another. Oh, may God help us with these things and help us to be an encouragement to one another in living in this radical, gospel-impacted way. Amen.